Good morning. My name is Tom Halverson. Please open your Bibles to Psalms 96, verses 1 through 13. And follow along with me as I read. It's page number 934 in the Blue Bible. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Good morning, church family. It's me again. It's not often that I get to preach two Sundays in a row, uh, and so when I do, it's a, it's a privilege. Uh, it's always a privilege to be in the pulpit and open up God's Word with you, and so I hope you have your Bibles open to the passage that Tom just read for us. Thank you, Tom. We're changing seasons here uh, into the fall. We're into October Although, if I looked at the weather report right, we're going to go back up before we go back down here. So, I don't know what month it is. Uh, but if you think back a number of months to February, remember what you were doing back in February. What some of us were doing in February was we were gathering as our strategic leadership team. And this team got together, started to get together back in February. And one of the uh, questions or, that we started to think through was a rather challenging one. What are Ephraim Bemidji's core values? What are those constant, passionate, biblical core beliefs that go deep and really truly empower and guide our ministry here at Ephraim Bemidji? We could say it this way, why do we do what we do here at this church? And as we thought about that question a little bit, one, one response was that, well, on one level, we could simply turn to our church's statement of faith. And that 10-point statement, 10 statement of faith is a, a series of theological convictions. Each one states what we as a church believe about things like our triune God, His Word, the problem of sin and the promise of the gospel, the church and how Christians are to live, and what is our hope in Christ. Each one of those ten statements begins with the words, we believe. And so certainly we could look at those theological convictions and recognize they do indeed shape why we do what we do. But as this strategic leadership team met, we, we recognized pretty quickly that um, the theology alone doesn't really tell us who we are as a local church. 
Because ideally, every single EFCA church should be able to unite around those very same theological convictions. But we are left with a question asking, well, what, what makes Ephraim Bemidji unique? What are the values that, that speak to what is most important to us as a church? So in that cold Monday evening back in February, our strategic leadership team started throwing some ideas at the wall. And I mean that quite literally, because if you walked into the chapel that evening, you would have seen on the wall dozens and dozens of little sticky notes. And on each one of those sticky notes was a, a word or a phrase that described some of the things that we as a church valued. Now, I don't know if I was trying to be smart or funny, but I do remember that one of the things that I wrote on a post-it note and stuck on the wall was the word food. Because let's be honest, as, at this church, we like to eat, and we do that well. We've got some tremendous cooks and bakers around here, whether it's at a newcomer's lunch or a potluck or a cookout or even just gathering in the Connection Cafe in between services and eating those homemade goodies. We, that's one of the things we value is eating together and enjoying good food. But probably on a more serious note, as, as we looked at some of these responses and we started to collate them and we stood back from the wall, we, we started to see some commonalities. Some common themes started to emerge from what people had written down. And so this strategic leadership team, they eventually landed on six core values starts out with God's glory, and then we talk about biblical foundation, congregational worship, caring for the body of believers, connecting with the community, and evangelizing the lost. Now, hopefully you've looked through those values as listed on our strategic plan, that document that we made available last month. Pages three and four of that document, you're going to see those six values listed but I hope you'll also see how each one of those values, those stated values, are grounded in Scripture. Because these core values are to empower and to guide our ministry. They, they stand behind that mission of becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus together. Those same values, they inform that discipleship pathway that we've been looking at over the last month to gather, grow, and give, and go. And next Sunday, when we come together and we celebrate our church's 100th anniversary at our combined 930 service, you're going to see how those same values are not only true of our church here now in 2024, but as we look back over the last century that these values have been there, that they are consistently true of e free Bemidji. And Lord willing, should God let this church stick around another 15 or 50 or 150 years, we're praying that he would keep it that way, that these values would continue to empower and guide our ministry for many, many years to come. Now, what I want to do this morning is look really just at the first of these six values. We're going to talk about God's glory. And as I re was reflecting on these statements this week and thinking about our core values, I came to the conclusion really that, that God's glory is the paramount value that the other five really derive their importance from this one. For example, we have this value of a biblical foundation. And we do that because verses like 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. And we start to think about what Scripture is. Well, our glorious, transcendent, sovereign creator saw fit to reveal himself in the pages of Scripture. And that every single page adds to that knowledge of God and it leads us then to respond with the angels in heaven 
who declare you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We value congregational worship because worship is what we were made for. To paraphrase the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is our chief end as men and women? Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We value caring for the body of believers, connecting with the community, evangelizing the lost. Because the very first chapter in our Bibles teaches us that God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And so God is glorified when we love our fellow image bearers. Not only our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also our neighbors who do not yet know the Savior. God is glorified when we tell other people, those that are lost, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, there are a lot of passages that we could turn to in the Scriptures to help us build this appreciation for the glory of God. The one I want us to focus on this morning is the passage that Tom read for us just a little bit ago in Psalm 96. And so I do hope that you have turned there, and if you haven't, that you would do so now, that you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 96. And as you're turning in your Bibles to Psalm 96, I want you to think about this passage like an invitation. I want you to think of Psalm 96 like an invitation. And as you're doing that, I want you to think back to the last time you went to your mailbox and you pulled out an invitation. Yes, we live in a digital world, and so sometimes our invites come via email and text message, but every once in a while we'll get a physical piece of mail that is an invitation. Maybe it's a, a graduation party invite. Maybe you're invited to a wedding or a baby shower or simply a birthday party. As we look at this passage this morning, I, I want you to view this psalm like an invitation. Because in this psalm, God's people are invited to consider His glory, to declare His glory and to give him the glory that is due his name. Let me bring us back to Psalm 96. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord... And most worthy of praise, he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. And so first, this psalm is inviting us as God's people to consider his glory. Last month on, in the New York Times, in particular in the New York Times website, there was a really interesting article that was posted. This article was considered a, a test of, of our focus. And so the authors of this piece, they invited readers to view a piece of art and to do so for 10 uninterrupted minutes. And what they chose was this image from the 16th century. It's a tapestry known as the unicorn rests in the garden. And what you did on this website was you clicked on the image and it sort of took up the whole screen. And at the top, there was this little timer that started to count up. All the way up to 10 minutes. And every once in a while at the bottom of the screen, there would be a 
a, a, a prompt, a cue to, to look at this piece of art and, and to, to think a little bit differently about it, to look at a particular aspect of it. And you were to give this piece of art ten uninterrupted minutes of thinking about it and pondering it and viewing it. I did not last ten minutes. <laughs> I gave up. But as we read the first half of Psalm 96, we are invited to consider God's glory. Again, I want to read the verses one more time. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and glory are in His sanctuary. Now as the psalmist writes these words, I don't think he's just merely heaping up adjectives for the sake of being poetic. What he's trying to do in these verses is to capture, to, to try to express in, in words the inexpressible beauty of the glory of God. Great is the Lord. And as he reflects on God's greatness, he says that God's deeds are, are marvelous. When we stop and we consider all that God has done in creation and in redemption, and throughout salvation history, we are to marvel at His work. He reflects and sees that God's power and His strength are unmatched. That the so-called gods of the nations are nothing. They are worthless idols. God alone is worthy of praise. He's the one who formed the universe and therefore is worthy of honor and is worthy of reverent worship. And he uses words like splendor and majesty in order to remind us that God and God alone is our sovereign king. Now how often do we just stop? How often do we just pause and take in a passage like this and just Meditate on it. Simply consider the glory of God. Because these verses are painting for us a very vivid picture of God's glory in all of its beauty. And so if a tapestry from the Middle Ages is worth us taking ten minutes out of our day to observe and to study and to ponder, how much more should we give our attention to Scripture to stop and consider God's glory? Consider the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Consider what John meant when he said that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That we've seen His glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul who said the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. You see, God invites His people to consider His glory. 
And when we do that, when we consider God's glory, we must not then keep what we see there to ourselves. Look again at the very first few verses of this psalm that tell us, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. In this particular passage, God's people are commanded to sing, sing, sing. Three times in these verses, this word sing is used. And it's used to describe this expression of praise. God's people are to declare His glory. They're to declare His glory all the time, everywhere, to all peoples. Even that word declare there in verse 3 has with it this idea that, that God's people are to announce His glory to the nations. We could almost translate it like preach the gospel of His glory, the good news to all people. In other words, in addition to considering God's glory, God's people are to declare His glory. We're to declare God's glory in song. Verse 1 invites us to sing to the Lord a new song. And how appropriate it is that today we have learned a new song. A new song that we're going to sing together even next Sunday to the glory of God. That song deeply devoted that Jason and the team just shared with us as we gave of our tithes and our offerings is composed for one reason. It's for God's glory. Yes, the occasion for writing that song is our 100th anniversary celebration. But if you pull out that lyric sheet in your bulletin and you read through it, you'll notice that the song is not about our church. The song is not about our ministry. There's not even a mention in it of our church's anniversary. Because the song is not about us. It's not even for us. The song is about our glorious God. The song is for declaring His glory. You see, God's people are to declare His glory to one another in song. But they're also to declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. By now, if I were to ask you what the mission of the E Free Church of Bemidji is, I hope that you could get something out like that we're becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus together. That ought to ring a bell by now. Maybe the more difficult question would be do you know what the mission of the EFCA is, the Evangelical Free Church of America? I don't expect you to know this. But if you were to Google the EFCA website, you would find right there on the front of that page their mission statement, which says, We exist to glorify God by multiplying transformational churches among all people. Now that rings a bell. And this isn't a sermon about the EFCA or a commercial for our denomination, but I want you to notice how that statement even echoes the words in Psalm 96, verse 3. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. God's people are invited to declare God's glory even last Sunday when we were looking at the fourth G of our discipleship pathway, that word go, I mentioned last Sunday that whether God is going to call you to declare His glory locally or globally, that all of us as God's people are called to go. And what we're called to declare is His glory among the nations. We are to go and to declare what God has done, that He has done marvelous things. I couldn't help this week as I was thinking through this passage in that phrase, 
marvelous, or that word marvelous, just stood out to me. And what, what happened was it was almost like a flashback for me. Because one of my favorite church memories from when I was a kid was singing a particular hymn on Sunday mornings. It's a hymn called Earth and All Stars. Now, it's not one that we sing even at our traditional service here that often. I can't even remember the last time we have. It is in our hymnals. It's uh, 357, if you're curious. But at my church, when I was a kid, we had a big sanctuary. And maybe it was just to scale because I was a kid, but it was a big sanctuary. And in the back of this big sanctuary, up in the balcony, was this huge pipe organ. The pipes were enormous. And I absolutely loved it when our organist would play. Because the sound of that pipe organ would fill that sanctuary. There were times when you could feel the vibrations coming from those pipes. There were times when you almost had to cover your ears because of the sound in that sanctuary. And when I read Psalm 96 and thought through it this week, I could almost hear the sound of that organ blasting out what would have been my favorite hymn. Now, I'm not even going to attempt to sing it, but I'll read some of the lyrics for you. First verse says, Earth and all stars, come rushing planets, sing to the Lord a new song. O victory, order from chaos, sing to the Lord a new song. Second stanza says, Hail, wind and rain, come blowing snowstorms, sing to the Lord a new song. Flowers and trees, soft, rustling, dry leaves, sing to the Lord a new song. Third stanza says, Trumpets and pipes, Come, clashing cymbals, sing to the Lord a new song. Harp, lute, and lyre, low humming cellos, sing to the Lord a new song. And then the refrain, He has done marvelous things. I too will praise Him with a new song. And what I love about this hymn is that in each one of those verses, as it builds, all of creation is being called upon to sing to the Lord. Even in that third stanza, the the very instruments that God gives His people the skill to, to build and then to play are to be offered to God in worship. Which leads into the second half of this Psalm 96, beginning in verse 7, where the psalmist writes, Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Indeed, the psalmist is using some rather poetic language to describe the joyous praise and and worship that is offered by the very heavens and the earth, the, the sea and the creatures within it, the fields and even the forests. But as I read those verses, I asked myself a question, well, what... What does it sound like when the creation worships its creator? And I bet you could answer that question. Because I'm sure that you can think about a time when you have heard the creation singing about the glory of God. Maybe it was the last time you were at the ocean. 
and you just heard the, the sound of the pounding waves hitting the beach. Maybe it was this summer after the sun went down and the crickets and the cicadas and the frogs began to sing. Maybe it was in the winter, in the early morning after the snow had fallen that you went outside and you heard that familiar crunching sound as you walked on the snow. You see, creation is singing to its creator. And what the psalmist is describing in those verses 11 to 13 is what he is inviting us as God's people to do in verses 7 to 10, that we are invited to give God the glory that is due His name. Just like the sing, sing, sing in verses 1 to 2, there in verses 7 to 9, again, the psalmist says, Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness and tremble before Him all the earth. We don't use that word ascribe very much these days, but it simply means to give or to bestow upon that God's people are invited to ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. They're to give Him the glory that is due His name. The worshiper is told to bring an offering and come into His courts. But really to, to understand what does it mean to give God the glory that's due His name, it might actually be more helpful to consider the very opposite. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome about the good news of the gospel, he first needed to address a very fundamental question, a fundamental problem. Here's what Paul had to say about our failure as sinners to give God glory. From Romans 1 verses 18 and following, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, which have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Now, you may listen to what the Apostle Paul says there, and you might not be someone who fashions wood or stone into an idol. You might not make it into a form of a bird, of an animal, or a reptile. But as the reformer, John Calvin, has famously said, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. And if God's glory is paramount, then we are to ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due His name. And if that is true, then we should ask God to expose our idols. Because we were made to worship, but the question is who or what is the object of our worship. You see, Psalm 96 is an invitation. It's an invitation to each one of us. It's an invitation to us as God's people to consider God's glory. It's an invitation for us to declare the glory of God. It is an invitation to give God the glory that is due His name. Our church's core values are stated to empower and to guide our ministries. And by God's grace, may we continue to be 
a church that values the glory of God above all things. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, it is good to meditate on your glory. Though we can't fully take it in, that words in human language barely capture your majesty and your beauty, your glory. But we need to pause and we need to think and we need to consider your glory that we might declare it, God, that we might give you the glory that is due your name. Whether we do that in song, whether we do that in our works, the way we live, the way we think, God, we want to give you glory in all things. Help us to do that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.